So, uh, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, final uh, session, um, which is going to be divided with, well, with, with a break in, in the middle. Uh, so for this uh, first part, we're looking at the second part of the Collections and ex Exhibitions uh, session. Uh, before introducing the next speaker, I want to also call your attention to the General Assembly. I uh, put the link to register for the General Assembly into the chat. And uh, I think this is the only time where we'll really be able to talk to each other and to interact and uh, to have uh, conversations and also in small groups. So it would be really nice if you could uh, join as uh, much as possible. So our next speaker is um, Jacqueline Charlevaux, uh, and she will talk, she will give a short report on the Pacifique Contemporain 2020. So Jacqueline, you can start. Right, well, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say how happy I am to have this opportunity of presenting our project. And secondly, I'd like to thank all of the organizers for organizing this conference. Uh, some of you may all be already be familiar with the exhibition that I co-curated in 2015 with Caroline Verco entitled Pacifics Contemporain. We also organized a three-day conference, uh, which was held to coincide with the exhibition openings. Pacifics Contemporain brought together 13 Pacific and Maori artists from Aotearoa and was held in nine different galleries, museums and institutions in Le Havre and Rouen in France. The second edition of the conference Pacifics Contemporain was supposed to take place in 2020, which would have meant five years after the first edition. However, because of the pandemic, we had no choice but to cancel and to reschedule everything. The project came about in 2019 when I was contacted by a colleague at La Havre University who asked if I would be interested in working with her students on a creative writing course. She had been contacted by the editor of the Tahitian book edition, Vendizila, who was celebrating its 30th anniversary. They planned on sending a number of writers from the Pacific to France to talk about their work. After numerous meetings, we decided on organizing a couple of workshops with the students and writers, as well as organizing another Pacific Contemporain conference in 2020. After speaking to the director Thierry Hénin of Les Edards, Le Havre and Rouen Art School, we decided to set up two residencies that would focus on writers and poets and which would coincide with the conference. Tortai, an association that promotes Pacific artists in New Zealand, proposed to work with us in selecting the artists for the residencies. So in this slide, you can see on the left, the logo for Tortai, and on the right is director Courtney Sina Meredith uh, with the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. And this was taken at the opening of the new Tortai Gallery, which is now in central Auckland and was in July, oh, the opening was in July, 2020. However, just as the project with Tortai was falling into place, COVID-19 descended on the world and the rest is history. Then in 2020, the Natural History Museum in La Havre contacted me and asked if we would be interested in working with them towards their exhibition entitled Australie, opening on June 5th, 2021. We decided on a collaboration for the conference at the university. The exhibition Australie will consist of 220 drawings by Charles Alexandre Le Soir and Nicolas Martin Petit from the Bonaparte expedition to Australia in 1800 to 1804. The Charles Alexandre Le Soir collection consists of over 8,000 drawings and manuscripts, and a good part of the collection belongs to the museum in La Havre. Le Soir actually became the first ever director of the Natural History Museum in La Havre in 1845 and held the post till his death the following year in 1846. Gabriel Baglion is today the curator in charge of the Le Soir collection and the exhibition Australie. The drawings selected for the exhibition will be exhibited alongside contemporary art from Australia. Themes will include animals, geography and marine environments. 
When preparing for the conference, we decided to concentrate on the idea of storytelling and narratives in the Pacific, even if sadly the original projects we had planned in 2019 were no longer viable. Involved in the organization of the conference is Caroline Verco, Fanny Dutille, who's a lecturer on Aboriginal women writers, and myself. The theme for this year's conference uh, is past and present unfolding narratives in the Pacific. While the, world, word, sorry, while the word narrative is to be understood in its broadest meaning, a spoken, written or drawn account, the adjective unfolding focalises on revealing, unveiling, disclosing and unravelling narratives that pass in different layers of understanding and perceptions in the present. Associating the two words unfolding narratives inspired us to assemble four axes that would allow researchers from a variety of fields to come together and explore and evoke narratives in and concerned with the Pacific. These include history, literature, anthropology, and visual arts. The conference originally planned for June 2021 will now take place in September from Wednesday the 22nd to Friday the 24th due to the pandemic. Participants will be invited by the museum to visit the exhibition as part of our collaboration together, as well as the museum's stores and its collection. Courtney Sinye Meredith, who is a poet and writer, as well as being the director of Tortai, has kindly accepted our invitation to be one of our key speakers. The conference will hopefully be attended physically by participants traveling from Europe and France in September and by Zoom for anybody participating from the Pacific or anywhere else in the world outside of Europe. Another part of this project involves an exhibition by the artist Greg Simu. Originally planned for May 2021 at, the, at La Galerie 65 in Le Havre, uh, this was unfortunately, it was only this week in fact, that unfortunately uh, the exhibition was postponed until May 2022 because of all the tight restrictions currently taking place in France. As the curator of this exhibition, I wanted to put together an exhibition which resonated with the darker side of Aboriginal and Australian history, and in particular, the Stolen Generations. The series Mother by Michael Cook that I first encountered at the Meg in Geneva as part of the exhibition, Le Fait Boomerang, curated by Roberta Colombo, still resonated in my head as well as Greg Seymour's photographic work, work um, Blood Red. Although this series of work doesn't directly refer to the stolen generations, it does speak about displacement and upheaval of Aboriginals from their land, their knowledge and people. It also explores colonial as well as contemporary histories. Simu shot the images in Cohen, a remote indigenous community that is around 70% Aboriginal in Cape York in far north Queensland. He worked in consultation with Cohen artist Naomi Hobson and an array of people from traditional owners from the Cohen region to community elders, teachers, police, stockmen and actors. When talking about this work, which incidentally was shot between 2016 and 2017 and has been exhibited only once in Australia, Simu said, these are fictional interpretations of factual evidence. Colonial history has been written by and in favour of the conqueror. I'm looking at the same facts and coming up with a different picture. The conqueror here refers to the British invaders, who, according to Oscar Holland, from 1788 to 1934, killed approximately 20,000 20, Indigenous people in Australia during the Frontier Wars. Those who weren't killed were either imprisoned and forced into labor in the sugar and pearling industries, or they were displaced and removed from their homelands, and some of them never returned, in fact, a large majority. Simu portrays the oppressor, but also ironically reverses the roles, thereby cre recreating the narrative, so that we see the oppressor in some of the images in chains and being guarded by the oppressed. In another set of images, uh, Simu references the pr police brutality that indigenous people face or have experienced in prison today, leading to death from physical force or even suicide. The work also includes a video entitled Testament. We will be showing the entire photographic series and work and video work of Blood Red by Greg Simu 
at the Galerie 65 in May 2022. A seminar will also be organized with the art school in Le Havre and its students to coincide and valorize the exhibition, as well as the narratives of indigenous people from the Pacific. The master's students on the creative writing course at the university have also been invited to write a critical essay, which will focus on the exhibition. We are very excited to be hosting this exhibition and be able to show the body of work that has of yet not been exhibited in Europe. We are also hoping that Greg Seymour might be able to join us for the exhibition in 2022, but only time will tell if that's going to be possible. So to conclude, here are some important dates to remember and to jot down in your diaries. Uh, so first of all, the exhibition Australie, uh, which will take place at the Museum des Soins Naturels du Havre from the 5th of June to the 7th of November in 2021. The conference, international conference, taking place at the Université Loire Normandy, so Pacific Contemporain, deuxième edition, past and present unfolding narratives in the Pacific, which will take place on the 22nd to the 24th of September. Call for papers is now open. The deadline is the 8th of June, 2021. Uh, Blood Red, uh, Greg Simou, uh, taking place at the Galerie 65 Le Havre in France, from May to July 2022, and then of course the seminar to accompany Greg Seymour's exhibition, which will take place in May 2022, uh, with the dates to be announced shortly. I really hope uh, that I will have the opportunity of seeing some of you either in La Havre in September for the International Conference, uh, if not in May 2022 for the exhibition Blood Red. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, it looks like a very exciting agenda and we're all looking forward to being able to actually go to museums and uh, see exhibitions as well. Um, so our next speaker is uh, George Nuku and he, he will present a paper entitled The Pandemic of Art 2020-21. So you can join us, George. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> am I uh, am I okay now? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay. Atena Kotukoto. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello to the PAA, and hello to everybody uh, who is registered to uh, participate via Zoom. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to do this. Um, I'm George Nuku, and uh, I wanted to speak. Uh, about uh, the, the last year uh, as a, at this very moment, it's exactly like 12 months since the, since uh, COVID-19 really hit, hit here, hit my life. And so uh, I'm, I, I, I named my talk uh, a pandemic of art uh, for, for, to cover 20, 2020 to 2021, March to March. So um, my year started with uh, an invitation from the Museum of Okunkunda to participate in the uh, a Sea of Islands Masterpieces of Oceania exposition. And uh, I was shown the space and, and with consultation with the team and, uh, and, and I came up with an idea to, to fill the space that was given uh, to make, to create a site specific work. And uh, the invitation was extended to, to elaborate further on my bottled ocean theme of Using the using using plastic bottles and, and plastic repurposed uh, materials to <clears throat> to not only speak about the, the the situation in the oceans and the environment, but also to um, have further conversations about my own ideas about plastic, which are quite well known. So yes, um, it was a fantastic experience. I, I have to say, um, the, the 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 people of the Netherlands really. Um, Got, got involved and uh, mo mobilized with, with, with several um, several environmental groups, uh, independent groups coming to the coming to 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 participate with the museum and 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 several members of the public coming to volunteer. So yeah, we managed to. I think when, when I arrived, by the time I arrived to start the project, the the team had 
pretty much processed 7,000 odd plastic bottles. And uh, coupled with that, uh, close, if not more or less or around uh, 200 odd people from both inside the museum and, and, the, and then the general public came, came uh, and uh, yeah, they, uh, they did everything from the preparation of the pieces of plexiglass through to uh, cutting and assembling the bottles. And uh, yeah, they, did, they, they, they were involved in every single phase, uh, including the New Zealand embassy stuff from the Hague. It was a pretty cool experience. And uh, over, over the course of 11 days, we, uh, we constructed uh, the, the, the elements of the, of the installation piece itself in the room. Uh, so it consisted of, uh, it consists of, I should say, it's still in there in Leiden, uh, a, a coral formation made from the ends of the bottles with uh, medusa and fish hovering above it and, and a 6.5 meter high uh, totem, which, I, which, which I've named it titled uh, Tung, Tungaro uh, Totem Mutation. So there you have uh, them in relation to each other. <clears throat> Here's a ground view uh, of, the, uh, of the ground floor of the space, because it's, it's in fact two spaces, with the, uh, the base of the, of, of the Tangaro Totem uh, on the ground floor. And then you can see uh, it from, seen from the mezzanine area looking down. So the idea was to um, make full use of the two spaces in, in, in the one space, both the ground floor and the mezzanine. And, uh, yeah, it was a, it's a memorable experience for me. And uh, as I said, uh, the, the, this project was just before the onset of um, COVID-19. So, so I had the luxury of having, you know, there was no issues of social distancing or masks or anything like that. I, I had an army of people and we, uh, we created this, uh, we had this fantastic time together. Uh, as soon as I had completed, um, the, the, the project for the Museum Volkenkunde, I had a week off and then I was off to, uh, off to, um, to uh, Geneva, sorry, to Geneva, yeah, that's right, to, to, to start my next project, Bouta uh, à la Mer Te Ao Māori for the uh, Museum de, de Geneva, that, that's the new, uh, Museum of Natural History. And uh, I was literally five days into that project and then the axe fell and I was told that the museum was closing, everybody's not working anymore, and I, I should leave uh, the next day. So I did, came back to France, and upon my return to France, where we all went into lockdown, full lockdown, so we could, I couldn't go anywhere, I couldn't work like I was, like I was accustomed to. My studio for the municipality in Rouen was, uh, was closed, we, we couldn't, I couldn't go in there, so I was essentially stuck at home. So I had to make some changes. And one of the changes I made was I created a, a, a Facebook group, public group uh, called Remember the Future Worldwide Art. And this idea came to me for the purposes of, of aiding people and introducing people who were in, who were in confinement all around Europe. And, uh, and as it started to go into New Zealand as well and other places to um, submit um, designs and drawings for colouring in, you know, with the idea that people stuck in confinement, families, and especially young people, children, could create art. And uh, yeah, it, it really took off. Uh, it's, it presently has close to, yeah, nearly over 300 and 3,500 members from all around the world contributing art. But in that time of the confinement, it, it was really, really active and, uh, yeah, I, st I, I carried on the bottled ocean theme further by fusing the idea of Maui, pulling up the, 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 the fish and Maui uh, using ancestral, deploying ancestral uh, ideas to, to uh, tackle uh, current environmental concerns. Yeah, so other, other artists, friends of mine, uh, you know, well-known artists in, in uh, Aotearoa in Australia uh, submitted designs free, freely for, for, for people to color in and stuff and, and work with. It was really a great thing that people supported it. Uh, we, had, we, we have contributors from Polynesia, um, 
from Tahiti, from uh, the Tiratoa, from Cook Islands, from all over the Pacific, from uh, Micronesia, you can see in the corner there. And people, people uh, started adding more and more uh, works to the, to the project. As you can see through the stuff from, uh, from the Marquesas and uh, even as far afield as um, Central America and Mexico and, uh, and Southeast Asia and Indonesian artists were, were, were um, contributing works to freely share with people. And uh, yeah, it, it had, it's got its own life. <clears throat> Then, then people started submitting back um, the, the coloured in renditions of uh, of the works, and uh, and it was interesting to see that you know how varied it was, and they were coming from all over the place. Uh, for example, in this panel here, there's there's my original drawing, and then there's an artwork from in the top right from uh, from a Maori person, another one from a, from somebody in Venice, and another one from somebody here in France. So that, the 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 the, the the input was coming from all over the world. This particular drawing speaks about Maui, uh, Maui's uh, childhood, as he as he's um, collected on the beach, from 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 his mother uh, wrapping him in her hair, thinking he was stillborn, and making the the, the funerary rites to Tangaro and casting him into the sea, wrapped in her hair, and how the, uh, the 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 jellyfish and the mackerel and all these other animals. Uh, Pushed, uh, pushed this little bundle it, as it floated on the shore. They pushed it to the to the to the beach, and the gulls saw it on the beach, and they started picking at the the seaweed and the tendrils that were wrapped around uh, this little cocoon that Maui was in. And Maui Maui uh, you know cried out from the from the pain of the the birds picking, and they realised he was still alive. So they took him to his uh, great uncle Tamatirangi, who uh, who lived in a cave, and uh, he was blind. And Maui, uh, Maui was forced to grow up in this cave, and uh, he lived a Spartan life in this cave, you know, subsisting on sea lice and and the cockroaches. And but but in, in return for looking after the old man, uh, the old man imparted all his knowledge to Maui, uh, in, in what we call a, a, a the form of a wananga. A wananga is a situation of uh, <clears throat> of focused learning. So Maui's uh, Maui's whole upbringing in those formative years took took the form of a wananga and uh, and and in, and in this time Maui uh, learned the gifts of ch changing his form into animals uh, he he uh, he brings to the world uh, the the art of kite flying of uh, cord cordage of plaiting cords and of um, and of fire of um, string games so-called games, which are in, in, in fact a, a whole set of codified uh, codified knowledge and several other things and meditation and levitation. Maui, Maui brings all these things to humanity after his time in the, in, in the cave. And the point I was trying to make was that in our time of con confinement uh, and lockdown to, to see it as a, as a form of a wananga and to use that time wisely. And so that, that really is the basis for the, for, for, was the basis for this project uh, with, with the colouring and stuff. And you can see, uh, yeah, people started sending back coloured color in renditions of, of the works. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was really an interesting time. This one is quite poignant in particular because uh, this work was created, was coloured in by both um, an eight-year-old boy on the top and his father, who's in his mid forties on the bottom and they were both from Lombardy area and they were under extreme uh, duress in that time uh, with, the, with, with the escalating uh, deaths of, from COVID-19 in, uh, in Lombardy region. So it gave them a real solace and, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, it gave, it, it felt like there was, they appreciated the contribution that I was trying to put to in this time. After after um, after I felt it was safe enough to travel again, I returned home to Aotearoa and participated in a, an, a, an exhibition of my iwi, of my uh, my uh, my tribal group Nati Kahungunu, and we um, the show was hosted at the Hastings City Art Gallery, and there were thirty artists from my iwi who participated. And uh, and in this image, the two bottom works are 
uh, are my works of uh, Wales and the two top works of my, my brother Daryl of his paintings of, of renditions of uh, exploring Heitaki forms. So yeah, that, that, that took me home to do that and sp spending that time at home before I had to return to Europe to uh, back to Geneva to continue the project with, with, the, with the museum. However, at the same time, um, uh, the, the um, MIG, the Museum of Ethnography in Geneva under, uh, under um, Roberto Colombo uh, approached me and, and, and we, we spoke about possibly doing things while I was there at the same time in Geneva. And um, one of the things that came up was um, in, in, in the course of the project for the, for the Natural History Museum of Geneva was the incorporation of uh, the Māori ethnographic material in Switzerland. And uh, we were successful in getting cooperation from uh, MEG in Geneva of, and, and, and they did the incredible thing of, uh, of, of loaning their entire uh, Māori uh, collection displayed in the, in, in, in the gallery, in the galleries, the whole, the complete works was offered. So, Obviously, that left uh, 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 the question of there's a big empty um, vitrine there now. So, what do we do? And Roberto suggested that I uh, create create some works that we could put uh, in in the vitrine while, while the work while the while the um, the treasures were on loan to to the museum museum de Genève. And so, uh, so my first job arriving back in Genève was to uh, was to work on these panels at the MIG in their in their facility and create these. Uh, panels to go into the, the vitrine. We, an opaque film was put behind them and they, they, they became a kind of like a light box. And uh, the question is going to be, uh, and they're still like that now until the, until the show at the Museum Geneva is finished. And, uh, and then it, it opens the door further for um, further discussion about when the objects come back, the treasures return to, to, to this vitrine that what, what we can do with these panels. That is um, with the opaque material taken off the back and then they become transparent again. So that kept me busy for, for the best part of two weeks. And then I was able to move on to, um, to the project at the Museum of Geneva. And yeah, it was, so, so the, the title talks about Buta la Mea, the, the, the idea of a message in a bottle and to our, and to our Māori, the idea of uh, fusing Māori um, narratives and philosophies and ways of looking at things with, uh, with the plastic message as well, yeah, in the form of, in the form of uh, using the treasures. And, uh, and because it's a natural history museum, I had the further opportunity to um, incorporate um, specimens of natural history from Aotearoa, from New Zealand, in the form of bird life and and uh, other uh, vertebrates and mammals and and reptiles. Yeah. <clears throat> so so the the project was was uh, we had, was under certain restrictions with COVID, and I had to be, we, we were limited in the amount of people we could use, but. I don't know how, but somehow I managed to get my own way and, uh, and, and people came to help me. And uh, this is the entrance to the, to the, to the ex exposition. And uh, it, it, it has uh, the theme is elements of the, 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 the arches forming an architecture, which I've used previously, this kind of Hel Hellenic uh, type um, temple to, to say that well, in, in the course of, uh, climate change and, and, and things like that, what would happen if the levels in the Lake Lemon, Lemon uh, subsided and, uh, and at the bottom of Lake, Lake Lemon was this uh, sort of sunken civilization. And uh, so yeah, that, that's what I ended up coming up with and uh, some various views of it. And as you can see, uh, the, the incorporation of vitrines, existing vitrines in the space where, where I could where I could fuse together the treasures from the collections from both uh, Meg and and Basil, but sorry Bal, Bal and uh, 
and nat natural history specimens from the Museum de Genève and, and from uh, Bern. So uh, the, 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 the attempt was to bring it all together. I had, a, I had a great time. I was able to um, also call on, um, go behind the scenes and, and look at some of the, 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 the um, re replica models of animals that are, you know, that, that are in museums. And I was able to affect them and mix them with my own poly polystyrene sculptures, as you can see there with the lizard and, and, and create a whole scenography on the walls as well. Here you can see that I've, uh, with the incorporation of natural history and, spe and specimens and um, some of the Māori treasures from both uh, Baal and, 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 and Meg. And I think these are shots of the opening night and, and yeah, people are wearing their masks. <clears throat> so yeah, it was a, a, a successful time and a, a big project, you could say. I had, I had about, a, I, I think I had a week off and then uh, I headed, I headed, I headed to um, Rochefort in the in, in, in the south south uh, southern west western area of France to to work on a project that that has been seven years in gestation with uh, with conservator of um, mu museums of Rochefort Claude Stephanie who's also the curator of Musée Herb. and and this project was about my interest in the art, in the artworks from the voyages of Dumont de Ville the the under, and especially in the second voyage and the, with the Astrolab and in the third voyage in both in these in these cases the artists were uh, Louis de Sasson and uh, and uh, Le Breton Louis Le Breton in the third voyage and I uh, I consider them some of the some of the most beautiful uh, renditions of artworks of Maori uh, from from this voyaging period exploration period so I'm sorry George sorry to interrupt you have about Five minutes left. Okay, so the the, the work st stemmed from using the lithographs and how I modified them and created them into these uh, scenes of presenting them in in, um, in in the style of our Western art, high art, on, on usually on a red wall with gold frames and massing them together. And uh, so yeah, I, uh, that was the effect I was looking for. On on another wall, I used the large panoramic screens and treated them in, in, in a negative format with, with uh, white polystyrene, painted white, sculpted polystyrene this time. And they, I used them to, inter, to react with my vitrines. On another wall, I, a blue wall, uh, I, I took it further and I introduced a form of copper. And uh, finally, uh, on another wall, I did the same. The vitrines themselves were, uh, I, I, I went, I've, I've gone further with my treatment of vitrines and really made them into artworks and the personages inside was my way to present uh, the, the treasures on available from the museum of uh, Musée Urbe. So there's three, there was three, there's three vitrines in total. The, the last one here is uh, based on myself, my muko, my self portrait. And what made, what was interesting for me was not only did I use the collections from, from Rochefort, but uh, I also added my own works as well, supplemented it with my own works. Further, further works involved uh, uh, a kinetic works of uh, here, uh, the rendition of an astrolabe in reference to the ship, um, a, a list re representing the, uh, the, the, the terre, the world, and, and, and ideas of navigation, and, uh, and a waka against the blue wall. So some expanded views. And uh, and then I went further with the, with the, with the, with the lithographs and engraved renditions of the lithographs onto onto plexiglass and lit them, and it's a new direction that I'm taking with the with the works. Here is a taken from a famous draw, drawing from life from Louis Breton of a Māori woman from Otago, who wears a full face moko. I think it's one of the one of the only ones in the extant uh, I've seen, of a woman wearing a full face moko drawn from life. The, Another wall is a yellow wall, which incorporates a lithograph of a group of people performing the haka on, on, the, on deco, the deck of the astrolabe. Finally, uh, at the back, I incorporated a photograph of uh, a collection of, art, of, of Dumont de Ville voyage uh, treasures that was housed in the Museum of Caen that was destroyed during the Second World War with Allied bombing. So I wanted to incorporate that photo 
to talk about loss and, and uh, memory and all these kinds of things and mixing it with a bust of Dumont de Ville who's ha- who wears a moko and I've kind of incorporated Dumont de Ville into my world. And, and, and in front of that, a, another way to describe, to present objects the, my own, of my own making outside of the Vitrina method. There's a, there's a, on the 1st of April, there's a virtual tour coming, uh, being released by the Museum of Earth. And that link below is a, um, is a walkthrough tour that I've done uh, explaining everything that you see. Th- this has led me to, uh, to, to a, new, a new proposition project on my mind, and that's to, uh, to, to expand, the, expand the idea that I've just described further to encompass not, not just the, the, the voyages of Dumont de Ville, but starting from Abel Tasman and, all, and right up to the beginning of the 20th century with the idea of how of the lithographs and the voyage art informing Europeans and, of, of the Pacific and, and in this case of Māori and how it influenced their views of us and how it does to a large extent still. And how that evolution of lithography and engraving went on to photography and how collectors and anthropologists and ethnologists, museum people, took, took the collections and made their own compositions, photographs, and how they, they, they always seem to have a kind of trophy type appearance, of, su- suggesting you know, victory and defeat and uh, you know, vanishing people and vanishing ways of life, particularly at that time in the beginning of the 20th century when Māori people were at their lowest uh, ebb uh, in our nadu of uh, down to like 20,000 people. Oh, sorry, 40,000 people. And uh, that, that's where I'm going with this. And uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at European Union uh, initiatives and projects that, that are d- discussing, that are, pre- that are talking about um, museums reevaluating their roles, talking about decolonization, all this kind of stuff. And, and it's my, my, my way to, to, to try and engage directly with these partners of these initiatives. Uh, as opposed to just responding to invitation. I think I've done enough projects now to be able to reach this stage. And I'll leave you with a quote from, um, from uh, Māori academic um, Aroha Mead, who, by the way, whose father, uh, Hirini Moko Mead, was the first president of the PAA in 1978. And her quote is, uh, if you're not sitting at the dinner table, then chances are you're on the menu. So uh, yeah, this is where I'm going. I'm taking my seat at the table. Thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, Kia ora. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, can, can everyone hear me well? Yes. I've heard there were some problems with the sound. So, but it works. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, thank you. And uh, now we're going to, well, I'm going to introduce myself and Erna. <laughs> Uh, we're going to try and give you some idea of the exhibition that, that um, we organized. And that was actually uh, the reason why we were going to have this uh, PAA conference. Uh, so we're going to start off with a, a, a short film uh, that kind of leads you through the exhibition. And then uh, Erna and I will alternate uh, commenting on some of the slides that we're showing. Apologies, I just heard there's no sound. I'll try again.
So I hope it uh, worked for you, uh, that you could see the film uh, well. Uh, we're going to, I think Erna is going to upload the PowerPoint, but in the meantime, uh, I can start um, talking a little bit about the why we set up this exhibition. Uh, we uh, were actually inspired by the, o the large Oceania show that happened at the Royal Academy in uh, 2018, and then also traveled to uh, Paris, to the Musée du Quai Branly in 2019. Um, and as part of this exhibition, uh, actually one in eight objects came from our collections. Uh, and so that made the director at the time think um, that perhaps we could also organize a, a large uh, Oceania fo focused show since it appeared that we had a really good collection. Of course, Erna and I already knew that, that we had a really uh, important collection. Uh, and so for, for this show that we have in uh, Leiden now, we, we really try to, um, of course, uh, we worked with some, some loans, but we also really try to focus on our own collection. So some of the uh, pieces there, are, we have a large collection from uh, Western New Guinea, and some of these pieces have never been on display before and they get uh, highlighted. And that's what you see here in this slide, for example. The second uh, canoe um, is, uh, is a canoe that we actually almost discovered by accident going through uh, the stores and just seeing this, this, uh, this canoe, which had not been photographed, which had no description uh, in, in the museum uh, database. And so we researched this uh, catalog, uh, this uh, canoe, and found out that it was actually quite a unique example of a Humboldt uh, Bay uh, canoe, where you see some of the, the 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 carving, the beautiful carving that is done at the front and uh, the end of the canoe. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so for this exhibition, we also chose not to work with, we have of course different themes, but we chose not to work with a specific titles for the theme. And we chose to uh, use uh, quotes from uh, Pacific Islanders themselves to kind of capture the atmosphere of, the, of what we were, the, of the story that we were telling. So you, here you see one of, of uh, actually my favorite quotes uh, by Teresia uh, Teaiwa. And uh, I, th I think many of, uh, of uh, you will, uh, will know her and will have known her. Um, and uh, she, um, so, so we used for every space, we use this kind of quote to really have, uh, make the Pacific also speak uh, for itself. Uh, we also made the choice not to have object labels um, with uh, the objects. So in the vitrines and, and, and in the cases themselves. Uh, but to make the object labels uh, accessible via a booklet. And then also, if you didn't take the booklet or you, you, were not, you didn't want to walk around with the booklet, uh, you could also still have the information available with the labels that were on the wall uh, next to the kind of uh, um, large uh, space uh, labels. Can you go to the next one? And so this is just to, to, to give you some, some context of some of our of the pieces that were uh, that are on display. Uh, so here in these cases, you actually see objects from our own collection uh, with a, uh, um, some of the exceptional objects that uh, were also on display in the Oceania show in, in the, at the Royal Academy. But some objects weren't, such as the splashboard from uh, the Massim area and such as the a Solomon Island uh, prow um, ornament. Next one. And again, here it's just kind of taking you through the kind of get, get, trying to give you a sense of, of what uh, people could see and could experience. Next one. I slipped this in in case you wanted to say something about the layout and the structure of the space. Oh, you, you can say something about that. <laughs> no, I, think, I think you're better at it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, of course, as you see in, in this uh, layout, we have a, a slightly uh, a difficult uh, um, structure of the building. Uh, so we have a few large rooms, but then also we have this long corridor, which is actually not fit to uh, display objects. So we had to think of a way to kind of incorporate this corridor and making it part of the story while also um, showing um, 
yeah, while, while also trying to make the most of it so that it just didn't uh, become a mere uh, passageway where people just went from room to room. So the idea we had was to create this uh, large, this corridor, this long corridor, as, a, as the kind of backbone of the exhibition. Uh, so uh, the way it works is that every time when you enter this, uh, when you come out of a space and you enter the corridor, you get some kind of contemporary connections to, to the Pacific. So we try to talk about um, uh, things like uh, navigation, but from the contemporary view, uh, tattooing also from a contem contemporary perspective, uh, the use of uh, the kind of popular culture, uh, which is familiar to a lot of um, Dutch uh, people, uh, a, a popular culture such as uh, surfing, uh, such as the Hawaii shirt, uh, but also we connected to music and dance, um, to the uh, some of the uh, nuclear uh, testing that has happened and that still has uh, of course, um, repercussions today. And so every time people could kind of uh, make this connection by going through this uh, passageway. Uh, so George has, of course, shown already some images. So his work was really the centerpiece of this one room uh, with uh, behind the curtain, uh, also other objects from mainly from our collection that relate to this interaction between uh, uh, water and, and, and people. Uh, because we, there's always a, a large focus in, in our museum on making exhibitions also accessible to younger audiences. Um, and uh, so that was one of the reasons that we uh, developed this, uh, this interactive wall so when the exhibition first opened on the 20th of February, when things were still all really nice, <laughs> um, people could actually activate the, the, the stories on the, on the wall by touching them. And then the story would unfold and would always be in relation to some of the topics that we were uh, uh, talking about in the exhibition. So we have a topic about uh, sea level uh, rising, for example. Uh, we have a, a, a feature about the um, little um, uh, female figurine that you could actually see in the beginning of the exhibition that is completely tattooed. That was one of the star pieces also of the Oceania show in, um, in um, London. Uh, and that originally came from the, um, from the Munich uh, Museum. Uh, so um, that was a, a way of kind of engaging uh, audiences, younger and older audiences as well, because actually people could um, make the connection more easily with some of the topics that we were discussing and also making the connection to the, um, the, the interaction between the past and the present was really important in this exhibition as well. And also I think a sense of uh, Oceania as a geographical space as well, because it's quite unfamiliar, I think, for many of the Dutch audience. Exactly. And, uh, and for this wall, I, I need to mention that uh, Caroline Nede, who was uh, the project assistant uh, at that time, really was uh, instrumental uh, for that and also for uh, uh, helping and really coordinating all the volunteers who helped with uh, installing uh, George Nuku's work. And that was actually 230 volunteers uh, that uh, George mentioned, 200, but it's 230 with the core group uh, who did that for two weeks solidly. Yeah, it was a, an amazing, uh, amazing experience to see all these people coming together, working on, on, a, on a same, towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. uh, so here you have an image of this uh, corridor space where we did manage to put in some bar cloth, uh, the conservation uh, uh, requirements kind of fits were fit for for showing bar cloth and also security requirements and that also then connected back into the room the next uh, space uh, the next space was uh, was about homemaking and dealing how um, how uh, kind of uh, divinity interacts with human uh, with humans um, and this is also one of our uh, like star pieces uh, that perhaps Erna can say something about. Uh, so this also featured in the Oceania exhibitions in Paris and London. 
And uh, if you've seen it, you know that it's about two metres by two metres um, in, in uh, size. And it's probably unique. Uh, I understand that possibly there's another one in the British Museum, but I haven't seen it until I do. I, I won't believe it. Um, and it's got, I think, nine species of bird on there. It's unique. And I've actually shared this um, object on Facebook with groups uh, from Papua New Guinea from this area, and it blows people away. I think it's, it's a really stunning piece for anyone in the world. Oh, it's from Papua New Guinea on the south coast, um, Yule Island, if you are familiar with the area. Next. Yeah. So again, just to give you an idea of the space, so we had a few uh, gold figures. Um, here there were actually a lot of loans compared to other sections of the, of the exhibition, because like I said before, the strengths of our collections uh, lie really within Western uh, New Guinea. We do have a few exceptional pieces from Polynesia and from Micronesia, uh, but, um, but that's not our strongest uh, collection. Uh, so this is also just to, to give you an idea of how we set up the, the altar, the, which you can see in the, in the background. Uh, this was a, a place where um, a more kind of a, um, a solemn place uh, how, and talking about how people uh, remember and, uh, and commemorate their ancestors. Um, I have, uh, we have had uh, quite a lot of discussions about the altar that you can see uh, in the back, uh, because also before uh, Oceania was, the Oceania show was set up in, um, in London, um, there were um, kind of questions and, and uh, issues about whether it was appropriate to show this complete family uh, with the uh, immediate ancestor that is represented by a sculpture with a skull in incorporated. Um, and some people felt that was perhaps uh, yeah, problematic. Uh, and so they asked us to consult again with uh, Papuan communities, uh, which we did. We had in the past consulted with, with people uh, and they had not expressed uh, concerns about uh, displaying it this way. Uh, but we did a, a consult again, and we consulted this time around with people who live in the uh, Raja Ampat Islands, so who are descendants of the people who uh, once made these, uh, these objects, and also with people living in the Netherlands um, who are uh, related to this, uh, to these, uh, who have Raja Ampat uh, co uh, connections. Um, and there's a very small uh, Papuan community in the Netherlands, but they are very, um, um, well, um, yeah, connected <laughs> to, to what we do uh, in the museum. So they always like to be uh, involved. And actually both uh, groups, both in the Netherlands and in the Raja Ampat Islands, um, thought it was actually fine to show uh, these objects and they, they, they felt honored. And they felt honored that their ancestor was going to travel to, uh, to London, to, to Paris, and then come back uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and they felt it was an appropriate way to, and especially the way we uh, showed the, the altar, they felt it was very appropriate that the whole kind of uh, family was displayed open without a case, except for the immediate ancestor who had a, has a small case uh, around it. And initially that case was not done because of um, uh, because you know of, of uh, kind of ethic uh, reasons, but it was initially uh, thought of as a as a protection against dust and against people uh, wanting to touch uh, objects. But actually, the the two concerns came together, and and people uh, were actually very Papuan people were very happy with the way it was displayed there. And we also made sure it was not displayed in vicinity of. Uh, Polynesian objects, because uh, Polynesian, uh, some Polynesian communities had expressed concern of having human remains in the vicinity of other uh, Polynesian objects. And, and we might also mention the Rampa Ram from Vanuatu. Um, and actually, most concerns were, or the question was asked mostly by staff, um, who want to do the ethical and, and proper thing. And is this the right way to show 
um, material such as this. And we were also able to reassure them that we'd consulted uh, in Vanuatu at the Cultural Centre and asked what they did in their own museum and followed the same guidelines. So again, here, it, this is connected to some of the popular culture, so about surfing culture, about uh, bungee jumping. Um, so what is the relation to, to the Pacific? Uh, and this is, uh, and you see in between the, the well, next to the, to the left of the surfing uh, board, you see a little uh, kind of sheet, and that's actually the children's route. So children could go through the exhibition and, and uh, tear off a piece of paper and just, uh, and then there was a, a little kind of task. And the task was actually to look for red in uh, throughout the exhibition and find the red spots in, in particular objects. And then they get, got some information about how the color red is an important color in, in the Pacific. So again, this is learned from, uh, from Cambridge. So we were very fortunate to be able to show this uh, Hawaiian Cape. Again, and this, this space uh, talks about interactions, uh, colonial interactions, missionary interactions. Uh, and then we have the, the, the not the final room, but almost the final room, where we were able to show Lisa Rehana's work. Um, that also took some discussion because our space was not completely fit for her requirements uh, to show the work. Uh, so, but we finally managed to, uh, we were going to show it full length, but therefore we had to have a curved wall. And that was not something that she uh, wanted for her work. So we managed to show it in a slightly reduced uh, form. Um, so there were, I thought I just mentioned the contemporary artworks that were in the exhibition. Um, so there were approximately 120 objects and of those seven were contemporary art and they were distributed throughout the thematic areas, which I think, uh, well, we both felt was important that we had the contemporary, um, Pacific, uh, um, in together with the historic material because the historic material is so strong and uh, very engaging. Um, there's the potential in a place that's far away from the Pacific of people thinking that these historic objects are um, showing people today or that people from the Pacific are stuck in the past or this is their culture now. Um, and so that's uh, it was important for us to include in various ways. And one of the ways was contemporary art. We also did it through things like uh, making sure that the labels historicize things properly. Um, and there also was the intention of having tours done by um, members of the West Papuan community, um, which unfortunately haven't happened um, for obvious reasons. Um, and on the side, rather than uh, well, on the side, I will actually share a link to all of the works that you can see here. Um, Kathy Chetnell -Kitch uh, Kitchener, you may be familiar with her work, Tell Them, and she was also at the PAA um, International Conference as well, uh, where she did some work. Um, and this was in the area, the thematic area to do with water, and it actually was at the beginning of the uh, informational corridor. And it's interesting that Jacqueline was mentioned that Greg Simu had said uh, about fictional, it being fictional work about factual history. And actually, I think that that's the power of art in this case, where uh, poetic work and performance work can actually get to the affective truth of something such as sea level rise in this case. Uh, and Mark Adams' work, uh, and this is part of a series where he, uh, well, it was a very good work for showing the com complexity of and the richness of contemporary um, societies such as in New Zealand where people from Samoa have settled and uh, also have this rich cultural tradition that they're continuing in the, those places. 
Uh, and in the remembrance section, we included work by Talo Havini and Stuart Miller. And this was, uh, she made this work in relation to the Bougainville uh, troubles. Well, we say troubles, but uh, it was a pretty horrible um, conflict. And in this work, she is actually referring to the disruption that ha has happened and the loss that has been suffered by people who were born during that time of conflict and the disruption that they have from uh, their own culture and history and actually their own land as well. Uh, and that also relates to the mining industry, which is just outside of this room in the corridor. Uh, we discuss the mines and how they disrupt uh, people's lives. Uh, Yuki Kihara, um, in the link I'll share, you'll be able to actually watch this video as well. And Shiva in Motion was um, made as a memorial to um, uh, the earth, uh, the tidal, well, uh, earthquake. tsunami, <laughs> <laughs> earthquake and uh, disaster that uh, was suffered. And it's a remembrance of that. And finally, we've got uh, uh, Fiona Partington and Actually, would you like to talk to these because you know these works uh, better than me? Oh, well, yeah. Well, we, we so we closed off the, the exhibition with uh, um, with these works, uh, Fiona Paddington uh, works, and they actually there are three. Well, we chose it's a whole series, but we chose three uh, images, um, and uh, with these images, they of of course talk to the um, the collection of past uh, casts. That were um, that still are at the Musée de l'Homme, uh, and that's a uh, focus on on kind of physical anthropology and the whole kind of history, the really uh, quite um, negative history that goes with it. But with these work works, uh, Fiona Partington tried to kind of uh, reassess uh, the the these past the past, and especially to um, let people, uh, Pacific people. Uh, assess and appreciate their ancestors and, and, and know their ancestors in, in a different way and on their own terms as well. And so I think that's what she tried to do with these, uh, with these uh, powerful images. And then that was the end of the exhibition, but we made sure that there was a, a kind of a whole track uh, so that people, when they went upstairs, they could see the permanent display. And then we also had a small uh, display of photographs uh, focusing on uh, Pacific, uh, on the Papuan people uh, who are uh, fugitives, who, who fled to uh, Papuan, uh, PNG, Papua New Guinea, uh, because of the, you know, uh, very difficult situation they are in, in the Indonesian part of uh, New Guinea. Uh, and then we also had a small uh, display um, walking, it was like a loop that you could do on the first floor and then the, and the, and the ground floor. Um, and then we had uh, uh, some works of uh, uh, Esther Kochmeyer, who uh, focused on the Marshall Islands navigation. And actually, the next few slides we can probably do without because uh, yeah. George covered it a bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, you can see more action shots and actually a picture of Caroline Nade, who, who did the coordinating, uh, an amazing job with the coordinating. And I'll stop sharing my screen so that I can uh, give you the links because actually there's quite a lot available. And uh, perhaps... Uh, so uh, perhaps I'll go straight into the questions because we are a little bit uh, behind <laughs> in time. Uh, so I see a question here from uh, Francisco Blanco. Um, uh, hi, one of yeah. uh, what year is the child uh, child uh, rebellion? Um, actually, <laughs> and also the next question is also what size is it and what year is it? Uh, actually, I, I think I, I can share the the we have a little booklet with all the information on the objects, all the object labels, and perhaps I think that's the easiest way for me is to share that with you. Um, and then you can have all the kind of background information and also some the objects that you are referring to uh, Francisco they are uh, loans uh, so they 
uh, the, the museums, the loan uh, museum, well, yeah, the loan museums uh, will have perhaps some more information even. Oh, um, question for, is there an exhibition from Lisa McDonald? Is there an exhibition catalog? So no, there's no exhibition catalog, but we do have this uh, kind of a text uh, booklet that we can actually, that exists in PDF format and that we can actually share with you. Are there? Oh yeah. Uh, so Oliver Loop is uh, saying um, thank you all for the excellent presentations. Uh, a question to Wonu Erna: uh, Could you please say something about the visit visitors' feedback? Um, I think we can say a little bit about the <laughs> visitors' feedback. Of course, this uh, the exhibition opened in, on the twentieth of February. Uh, we had a very, uh, a very nice opening, uh, and uh, and then just three weeks later it shut. Uh, it reopened in June. Sorry, is someone trying to say anything? It reopened in June, and um, and so we saw that people were very enthusiastic. So the the visitors' feedback was very positive. And while this exhibition was set in well by mar the marketing department, they thought that this was an exhibition. Uh, fit uh, and really well suited for uh, perhaps a more um, museum savvy uh, audience. Um, but uh, we soon saw that actually children and families uh, really enjoyed uh, this exhibition and was, were very enthusiastic and were really participating in the children's route and were asking lots of questions. Um, so we had all yeah, all in all, we had a really uh, we had really positive feedback. Like uh, Erna mentioned before, we were also we had a whole plan of having uh, guided tours by uh, members of the West Papuan community. We had started conversations, um, and uh, and people were also enthusiastic to do that. But uh, of course, because of the situation, that that didn't work out. Um, and then we were open from June till uh, October. Then it was uh, shut for a short time, about three weeks. Uh, it was reopened and uh, it closed. has been closed since mid-December. Uh, Are there any more questions? <laughs> No, no, no more questions. Um, well, do we have questions for each other? <laughs> I have a little question for George. Uh, are any are any of the exhibitions that are currently supposed to be on, but obviously have been shut due to the pandemic? Are any of those exhibitions going to be extended? Yes, <clears throat> Gen Geneva has extended these to January next year, and. Uh, and the Musée Herbre in Rochefort has, have ex has extended their program to the end of August. Yeah. Great, okay, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, perhaps that's also something I can add because initially the, the, the exhibition was uh, going to close on the 23rd of August. Uh, and then we decided to extend it till, well, we were able also to extend it till the uh, 5th of April. Uh, but of course, with museum planning, with other exhibitions waiting to open, and uh, with the difficulty of transport in this uh, situation, uh, we were not able to, we did explore it, but we were not able to extend it uh, any longer. Um, I might also mention that uh, if you'd like to know a bit more about the development of the exhibition now, thinking behind it, um, we have an article coming out in the Journal of uh, Museum Ethnography in the next issue. And you'll also be able to get all of the information about well, where to go further if you want to learn about the artists and the works that are in there. OK. We can keep staring well, at each um, other. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, there's, there's another question uh, uh, from uh, Anita Hurley. 
Um, fantastic to see the uh, to see the Sea of Islands exhibition and also George's various artworks installations. Uh, we are sorry that I wasn't able to uh, see these. Can George tell uh, a bit more about the experience of collaborating with a large number of volunteers? Uh, yeah, it's, I'm kind of infamous for that. Everyone should sort of figure that out by now. Uh, I, I just seem to have this kind of ability to get people to come and help me. And uh, it's, it's really the, the Especially with the with the with the plastic bottle um, installations, there's no other way to do it but to involve a lot of people. Obviously, with COVID, uh, it's really changed everything dramatically for me. And this was this was the case even with the with the the current show uh, uh, around Dumont de Ville. I had to create that whole exhibition alone. And there was there was just no one was allowed in the museum to help me. Uh, I had one technician. And an assistant and that was it so it forced me to have to really rethink my practice and and it's interesting for practitioners the idea of vir in the museums of uh, virtual virtual experiences which, which which means you know in effect we could be making our in exhibition installations in a in a in a space where we live and it's just being to, to you know like a fake moon landing <laughs> you know we, we this this could this could well be the future of museums if, if uh, in the worst possible scenario that that um it's all just kind of like TV now. Uh, I hope it doesn't go that way. I know I know from what I've spoken to various museum people around that that uh, you're all hurting because you can't open your doors, you can't interact with people in public and and. Uh, I know here in France, it's it's coming to a head anyway, with kind of protests about, re, re, you know, culture being stifled and and people need to still purvey culture in society. So it's it's uh, this is this is the first time it's ever happened to me where there's like a virtual tour. Yeah, that that uh, museum Uber has put together that comes out next week. It's the first time and. And one way it would be cool for me, I wouldn't have to travel anymore. I could just make my stuff at home. But on another way that, yeah, that's, it's not the same as actually being in the space, is it? Yeah. What, what, what do you, what do you guys think the, the future is in that way? Well, I think what in, in our museum, at least, everyone is kind of hoping for it to go back to what it was. <laughs> Uh, and, and everyone's really, but in the meantime, of course, we are, we are trying to make the most of it, even though we just, for example, yesterday, we just opened an, an exhibition, a digital opening, um, What a Jennifer World in, in Rotterdam. And so just with the kind of idea that there will be uh, uh, people, uh, perhaps in a month, <laughs> walking in, in the exhibition, uh, but we're still trying to, yeah, we're still hoping that it's going to go back to at least a few people uh, being allowed, perhaps not in, in the, the same numbers as it has been before, but uh, at least in more kind of um, interactive way, because now it's really all uh, behind screens. And that gives a very different uh, feel to what you can experience actually in an exhibition. I felt incredibly nostalgic watching that little film that we showed with humans and, and moving around with each other. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, Hilke has uh, provided further information about the, um, the chart and the question that was asked. Yeah, uh, but I'm not sure whether Francisco can see it because it's to the panelists. Um, so the chart uh, came to the Museum uh, Fünf Continente in Munich in 1891. Okay. okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. We're having a, a short break now, and uh, we would uh, ask you to, to come back uh, 
just before four. So we can start at, at four. Thank you very much. Thank you.